The work is important. Turning things into wicker baskets is the thing you need to do before you die. So watching this tutorial is quite frankly the most important thing you're gonna do in this life. So buckle up, get ready. We're gonna turn your mom, your grandma, your great grandma, your... they're all gonna be wicker baskets. By the way, I made an add-on that turns this into a one button solution. Get it at cgmatter.com or you can just pick it up standalone. Oh, thanks for watching. That's right, we're making wicker basket converters, which isn't immediately obvious how to do. Imagine you have a mesh like this. So this is like the little add-on tool I made. When we make this a wicker object, we don't only need this kind of like woven pattern where we have these like alternating sine waves and one goes under and over and all this, but it has to follow the flow of the surface, right? And that has to be kind of a dynamic property. Here is the secret to do this and also yarn and any kind of conversion like this. I want you to imagine that we have a pattern and say we like this one. Well, what I can do with this is I can make a material, bring in that image texture, and when I view it, you're gonna see it maps onto the surface in a way that's like dynamic, right? It updates with this uh, mesh, and this is because it's attached onto the UV coordinates. I can shift these, whatever. And that's nice because now I can say, as long as I can put this on as a pattern two-dimensionally, then I can wrap it three-dimensionally. Except this time, instead of a texture, we're doing actual geo. So in geometry nodes, I'm gonna make a geo nodes object. I don't need this for now. And the first plan of attack is I'm going to put like a zero by one square, which represents UV space. And I just need to make the pattern that I want on here, and then we'll eventually transform it. I'm gonna go for this kind of sine wave approach. So we have a sine wave. I'm then gonna make a alternating sine wave. So it's kind of like one phase over. They're perfectly halfway out of sync. And then on the other dimension, they have to kind of like fit into each other. And those are also alternating sine waves. Well, I'm gonna start with a curve line that let's have it go on the X axis. So we can have it go in this direction. I can divide it into many different like sample points and say evaluate sine of x as you go this way and that will be the height. Let's take this curve, resample it a bunch. So let's say 30 samples and then I need to set position in a way that creates that sine wave. Let us do a math node that calculates the sine that is going to go into the z coordinate right here. And then we need to say calculate the sine as you go along the curve. An easy way to do this is there's this quantity called the spline parameter. You already know it. It has a field that says how far along the curve are you? So connect that there, you can see it's doing a bit of curvature. This is because, again, it goes from zero to one, whereas a sine wave goes from zero to two pi. That is its uh, period. Multiply it by two times pi, and now we have a full sine wave that we can kind of scale down to maybe 20%. This is going to be our scaling. This is going to be our two pi period, our offset sine wave. What I need to do is make a bunch of copies of this where some of them, every other one alternates. And I'm going to have that happen as we go up the y-axis. Just like before, I'm going to make a curve line. This one is going to go up the y-axis. I'm going to resample by, let's say, 10 points. Instance on points, we're instancing our sine wave. And now we have them all perfectly in sync, which is almost what we want, but they should alternate. In other words, I'm going to take its index. So it starts at zero. Then we have the first, second, third. And I am going to take either every even number or every odd number and just flip it. We do that by taking the index of the instance. And how do I say keep every odd or every even? That is what modulo is for. So when you take it modulo, modulo 2. It basically outputs 0 if it's even, 1 if it's odd, basically a, a true or false statement. And for this statement, I can scale instances. If I scale by negative 1, you can see it perfectly flips. We need to do this, but only for every other one. So for every other one, flip it like this, and now we have this kind of alternating pattern. I'm going to make maybe like 20 of these, and I need the same thing, but rotated, and they need to somehow perfectly interweave. Well, that's relatively easy because I can take this, I can transform it by rotating it by 90 degrees on the Z, but the pivot points in the wrong spot, shift it back over by one. In other words, we have this and we have this. Let's join these together, see what that looks like. And it's a very hard thing to read here. So one thing that's going to make that easier is bringing down the scales. And you can see it isn't, right? Like there's points that match instead of like weave under each other. This is best shown by turning this back into a mesh just for visual clarity. This isn't exactly what we want because these sine waves kind of intersect at their peaks and also their valleys, which means they need to be kind of offset. And if we look at the side view, you can see that this sine wave is like way too slow. It needs to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And then the question is, how frequently does it have to oscillate to match this thing going on? Well, in this case, you can see like if you imagine every single gap between these is a time where it has to weave over, under, over, under. There's one, two, three, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And that 19 number, by the way, isn't random because remember, we have 20 samples. So 19 is one or it's 20 minus one. There's going to be one less gaps 
points, then there are points, right? So if we have a line composed of two points, there are two points, but only a single gap. If we add another one, now there's three points, but only two gaps. I need to have this oscillate something like 19 times faster, which is fine, but that means we can't easily do this rotation like we did before because they have to be different from each other. We can go back to this period and maybe we can just take that and multiply it by 19. So now it should be going up and down 19 times. You want to bring up the number of samples so that, you know, you can see what's going on a bit better. And this 19 number, we should remember, isn't necessarily fixed. It is going to be the number of instances. So let's say that's 20 minus whatever that is, minus one. Okay, so here you can see we're multiplying by the number of instances minus one. It might be good to actually separate the count from the periodicity because we might want to do different things on different axes. I'm going to make two separate parameters here. So let's say there are 15 copies and the periodicity multiplier can just be a value. So something like that. I'm going to put these over here so that everything else can become a node group. I'll call this our wave generator and we can plug in custom numbers here. Maybe on one dimension, we have something simple like 15 iterations and a frequency of one, meaning there are going to be 15 copies and they do a single wave over here. Well, in that case, we also want another wave generator. This is the one that, by the way, we do our rotation to. And again, we have to have it go over, under, over, under, over, under, over. And that should be at a frequency of the number of iterations minus one. So in this case, it would be 14. This is a lot better, but it's not, again, matching. So we have this peak over here on this uh, sine wave that isn't really matching with this kind of thread over here. It has to be shifted a little. But then the problem is, like, there's too many waves, in a sense. So I know it's getting complicated, but what we need to do is we need to take the number of iterations. So let's say, let's connect that here. We'll say it's 15 iterations. We don't only want to subtract one, which is a good start, but we also need it to be half as frequent. So instead of all the peaks matching up with the threads that go over here, it needs to alternate, which means we need to divide by two. It should go half as slow. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to divide it by two. And now you can see it's almost matching. And all we need to do is shift it over a little. Now, the question is, how much do we kind of shift this over, I guess, on the y axis in this case? You can see that these waves that we're trying to weave through are exactly at this intersection instead of at a valley or a trough. But what we do know is we know that the distance of this gap can be calculated and it should be half of this gap is how much it should be moved over. The gap is defined by 15 minus one. And then we're going to take this and calculate the reciprocal. There are 14 gaps over here because there are 15 iterations. And we know that the total distance from here to here is going from zero to one. So to get a single gap, it's going to be one divided by that. And then because we want half a gap, I'm going to multiply this by 0.5. Take this, combine it so that it's only on the y-axis, and let's see what this does. That seems to have perfectly been the right thing, right? You can see this nice shifting where it alternates. So if you look at these strands over here, it goes over and under, over and under, etc. But now we have to have this work on the other dimension as well. We can just kind of reuse the math to get the frequency that we want. We now need to shift, but this time on the x-axis. So I'm going to transform geometry. I'm going to reuse everything we did before, but this time put it on the x-axis axis. And now everything should match almost, almost. They're perfectly out of sync. So I think what we need to do is we need to take this and have it shift the other way by negative one. And there we go. It took forever, but we have a interlocking pattern. This is why it was a pain, not even getting it on the surface, but just creating the pattern. This video is sponsored by Milanote, which in a one sentence description is a infinite canvas that you can use to kind of order your project, to upload files. You can use it with multiple people and collaborate at the same time. So for that intro, we're at the watermelon and the magic and the, the wicker, you can see I organized it in order. So here's footage of me like putting down the watermelon. I also have this other shot, but very relevantly, we have me kind of setting up and there we go. As you can see, there is no watermelon. Because of that, I did need a watermelon model, which I ended up uh, scanning on my phone. Here you can actually get the OBJ and textures. I put a link in the description for this board. So you can put boards within boards here. And here's kind of like my like templating of the logic that we had. The way you make this stuff is very simple. You have a sidebar of everything you need to build your board. For example, I can take a note and drag it right here and add any kind of information. I could say something like consider sawtooth or triangle wave. That's important to get different kind of uh, wicker patterns. Copy image, go back here, control V, and now you have your image, you know, automatically. In this case, let's put it in the column. Way too difficult. But if I was collaborating with somebody else, they could, you know, think about how to implement that in. One thing I can do is I'm going to go back to my home and instead of adding individual elements, I'm going to add a entirely new board. This can be about the math of Wicker. And to start off with a template, I'm just going to open this up. You're going to have all these template options. And let's go for, let's do a mood board. 
we have all of this. I'm going to use this template. And now we basically have all of these slots that are compositionally in a you know good place. Here I am showing the logic behind Wicker. I'm just going to open up this image over here and I can replace it with this kind of close up of how I like tied things together. I can easily delete a tile or like move it over. This one over here that shows kind of the proceduralism, which was a uh, gift to begin with. It's now loaded and you can just start like adding things. Whatever creative project you're working on, you start building your board, you go to share. You can either share on particular email addresses or if you're feeling frisky, make a link and copy and send it to whoever you want. In this link in the description, it will just take you right to Milanote. You can start using it with absolutely no time limit. Make an account and you're good to go. Thank you, Milanote, for sponsoring and let's get complicated with the um, wicker pattern. And to get this now to look like wicker, really the secret is, is when we convert it back into a mesh, we don't use this kind of curved circle. What I would instead recommend is using a quad. So this can be our profile curve. We can bring this down a lot and then we take whatever the vertical dimension is. Is that width? No, it is height and make it much smaller. And let's turn off shade smooth. The beauty of it is it is procedural where at the end of the day, this is the number we care about. So no matter what number I pick, it's going to be correct given that it is an odd number because of the division by two. To ensure it's an odd number, we can take this, multiply by two. This will take any number and turn it even. And then we add one. What this means is any number we put in is going to make this nice woven pattern. And now we got to clean up. So we start with the density. We make it even and we offset by one to ensure that this whole number is odd. And we now need to make a X and a Y thing. Well, for X, we just kind of plug this in where the iterations is the number we picked. And then the frequency, we subtracted one to get gaps instead of points. And then we half the frequency. So that's the case for both of these. So this is going to look like this. And then this is the other direction direction, which you're going to notice that we rotated, we shifted, we also shifted this other one, and then we turned it into a mesh. And that, <laughs> that is the um, idea here. Now, in reality, this kind of last part, we only do at the end. So at the end of the day, we take all this, turn it into a node group. This can be our weave pattern, and this can be our density. Now, the second biggest question in this tutorial, how do I take this and map it onto some geometry, like a cube or a cone or whatever? Well, remember, this is where that you UV map thing comes in. If I can take this mesh and map it onto UV space and then sample where the positions should be, we can go back. So we transform into UV space, we sample where the position was, and then we take this grid and move it back. That is the core idea. How do we do that? Well, there is a node for this concept, and that node is called sample UV surface. So that now that this perfectly aligns with UV space, we can sample where were the positions to begin with, and then we can map it back. We need to know what are we sampling? That's going to be the cube. We need to know what the UV map is that we care about? Well, that is just going to be our default UV map. And then the question is, where are we sampling and what information am I trying to sample from this UV map? Well, we know what we care about. What I ultimately want to extract is the position such that I know what position corresponds to each point in UV space. And then finally, for the sample UV, in other words, where am I now evaluating the UV map to get that position? Well, remember, the whole point was we have it perfectly overlapping in UV space. In other words, the position is where I want to sample. So I can sample UV space here, set position to here. And you're going to see it's almost going to work, but we get this kind of weird thing going on. This, by the way, is because we did a whole bunch of instancing here, which means at the end of it, we need to turn it into geo realize instances. Now it maps perfectly onto the cube with a few exceptions. But as I increase the density, it maps to the cube. If I make that an icosphere, it maps onto the icosphere. The reason that there are some points that are behaving weirdly is you can think of this as the weave pattern perfectly takes up like the zero to one space and has this complicated pattern. The thing is not all of UV space actually matters here, right? We have a lot of empty space. As I shift around UV space, you're going to see that that error kind of changes. If I move it all off here, there's nothing. So what this ends up being is we just need to get rid of any point that is not valid. I'm going to take as valid, flip it to say what points are not valid. And for those ones, I delete the geometry. And now the beauty of this is, as I can just kind of rotate and pick different patterns, etc. But now that we've mapped our complicated pattern onto the mesh, we now need to get that weaving pattern back, right? You don't have the weave. Well, this is because we need to measure how high from the surface we were, in a sense. To do this, I'm going to store an attribute. I'm going to call this height 
which again tells us how high we were just based off this xy plane. So some values are going to be positive, some of them are going to be negative, and that is dictated by the position, specifically the z coordinate. I can like flatten it down if we want, I don't think it really matters, along the surface normal. So this is the surface normal at this point, this is the surface normal of the cube at that point, etc. We wanted to make that sine wave weaving pattern based on the height. So I need to know which way to go outwards and by how much. Well, super simple, I'm going to set position, which is going to let me move this in 3D space, and I need to know where the normal is that kind of corresponds with this. I guess we could do the UV surface again, but just to get a bit more control if we want to blur the um, normals or whatever, I'm going to sample the nearest surface. So it's going to say these lines, look at where you are relative to the cube and sample the uh, normal. I want to sample the original mesh, the original cube, particularly for the normal. And then if I offset on this normal, you can see it just kind of expands outwards, which is exactly what we want if we were to scale this. So at zero, it stays on the surface. And as I go outwards, it just kind of expands that way or goes inwards. And I don't just want a single number. I want to use this height that we evaluated before. This is going to be the height. I'm going to connect this in. All of a sudden, we get our weaving pattern, but on the surface. Let's take advantage of our procedural setup and make way more weaves and also kind of increase the thickness of this. Now, there is going to be some issues, which I'll address, but you can see it generally maps onto the surface dynamically. Now, this is great, but like I said, there are these issues where the weaving is now facing the wrong direction. Up top, it's great. Like, this is what it should look like, but then in any other direction facing X or Y, we get this weirdness. Basically, the issue is we have these nice distorted curves and we're trying to sweep this tiny quadrilateral to turn it into a mesh, but we don't know if we should sweep in this orientation or do we need to flip it? If I have a curve and I have this like rectangle that I want to sweep along here, should it be facing this direction or should it be kind of rotated, right? That's what we need to kind of decide. And that is what the curve normal is. That is the quantity that decides that. Whatever I pick, it changes this quantity. It turns out what we want to do is have a change along the surface. So I'm going to set this to free, which lets me kind of get weird here. The nice thing is that normal, which says which way is facing outwards, we already have. So just connect that here. And now all I need to do is swap these numbers because it seems to be inverted. So put that here, 0.01. The weave pattern matches our mesh wherever we go. And again, this is UV dependent, right? If I'm to modify our UV coordinates, it remaps. This means that if I rotate it by 45 degrees, that is how you get a diagonal weave pattern. What this also means is if we ever have breaking in our mesh, right? So let's say I take a vertex and I bevel it. You're going to see this breaks. The reason for that is it breaks our UV map. So at any point, if we get tearing in the geometry, you just re-UV map the uh, surface. And if you ever get uh, glitchiness, you can just kind of resample and uh, change the uh, density. So there's a bit of uh, debugging here, but generally it works. Let's try it with a different surface, like a torus, but it's a bit too dense. So I can just lower our UV space. And then you can see that these kind of quads are stretched. So I just want it to be a nice, even surface where all of these polys are pretty much squares. And the moment I do that, we get a nice weaving pattern. By the way, you might see this discontinuity over here. And that discontinuity exactly corresponds with this right here, these gaps, the seams, basically. A cylinder, we can scale this down until it fits nicely. If it feels like the top is denser than the sides, you can just sample the sides and make that a bit bigger to uh, match things. By the way, one thing to do to kind of fix some of this degenerate geo and this kind of discontinuity here is you might want to take these normals, which exactly dictate which way these things are facing, and it's totally fine to um, blur these. That seems to do something. So before, after, it just fixes some of this geo. You can see as I really stretch this, it gets kind of broken. I can just re-unwrap this however you want to do it, and that will fix that up. That is the general principle, making the pattern and mapping it onto a UV surface and three-dimensional space. Again, I want to say that this add-on, and by that, I mean the simple tool that just turns things into wicker, whatever that is, and it has all of these controls, by the way, the thing we basically made uh, before. That is going to be available either on Blender Market, or you can get it on my website at cgmatter.com with all these other add-ons and project files. So it took me eight hours. Like I thought I knew what I was doing going into this, but it was mainly this interlocking sine wave that I had uh, issues with. Hopefully uh, you learned something.